before I came here this morning, I was in the emergency room seeing patients. I still do not have a rapid diagnostic test available to me. Well, that's easy to do, is it not? Is it hard to manufacture? It is, it is easy to do for some countries. What happened in the United States is that the CDC created a test, Messed up a reagent. sent a test out to 50 states, and then said, oh, hold up, don't use it, let us fix okay, it. How quickly it's can now we get March. On track now, Matt? We hear that it's coming very soon, but I'm here to tell you right now, at one of the busiest hospitals in the country, I don't have it at my fingertips. I still have to call the Department of Health. I still have to make my case plead to test people. This is not good. We know that there are 88 cases in the United States. There are going to be hundreds by middle of the week. There's going to be thousands by next week. So and this is a testing people, issue. What do you do with people in the emergency room if you can't test them? Well, we call and we try to test. We isolate them. We have an outstanding team of, uh, of uh, infection control practitioners who know how to handle this, but they're hamstrung by the fact that we don't have a diagnostic test available. Are people getting sent home? Because I read reports of that over the weekend. We're not sending people home. We're making sure they get what supportive care we can give. But keep in mind, we now have this um, in New York State, right? The person who tested positive was only the 32nd test we've done in this state. That is a national scandal. They are testing 10,000 a day in some countries, and we can't get this off the ground. I'm a practitioner on the firing line, and I don't have the tools to... CDC is a bottleneck for this nation in doing the testing. Uh, you go to CDC, the tests have to go back to Atlanta, they have to do the test, they then have to send it back. I believe the CDC, CDC was caught flat-footed, I believe they're slow in their response, and I believe they're slowing down the state. Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney told the Conservative Political Action Conference that the coronavirus was the hoax of the day. The press was, 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 was covering their, their hoax of the day because they thought it would bring down the president. Uh, do you agree with Donald Trump's Chief of Staff Mulvaney that the coronavirus uh, is the hoax of the day? The State Department is doing everything it can to protect American citizens you, around the world. Do you world believe coronavirus is I, the I'm hoax not going to comment on what others are saying. You, you're, I'm just I, asking you, do you believe I, the coronavirus telling, is a I'm hoax? I'm just telling you what the Secretary of State is doing. Do you believe the coronavirus is a hoax? We're working to keep people safe. You can't even answer that question. Yeah, it's, I mean, a very, it's not even look, a gotcha you're, question. You're, you're, do you believe the coronavirus is, is a, a hoax? A, it's a gotcha moment. It's not useful. Take, is the coronavirus a hoax? Can you just answer that question? We're, we're taking it seriously. This is a, this is a, right. this is are a you, serious... At 12.15 today, are you in fact yourself speaking at CPAC? The, the, At 12.15 today, are you speaking? Yes, I am. I'm planning. All right, so you can only give two hours this bipartisan. 
group of members of congress and instead of answering questions on life and death issues from a bipartisan group of america's representatives you're going to go talk to a special interest group you sir represent all americans not a special interest group it is shameful you can't even answer basic questions i yell now the american people deserve some straight answers on the coronavirus and i'm not getting them from you How many cases of coronavirus do we have right now in the United States? Well, we have uh, 14 cases plus an additional, um, I believe it's 20 or 30 some odd cases that we uh, have uh, repatriated back into the U.S. from uh, a number of cruise ships. And how many are you anticipating? Again, uh, we're working with HHS uh, to, to determine that. How many are you anticipating? We do anticipate the number will grow. I don't, I don't have an exact figure for you, though. Do you have an estimate? Is someone... Is someone modeling that? Do you have any way of guessing? Uh, again, HHS, through their medical professionals. Well, yes, are... sir, but you're head of Homeland Security. Yes, sir. And your job is to keep us safe. Yes, sir. Do you know today how many uh, the experts are predicting? Uh, only, uh, we only know that, again, we anticipate those numbers to grow in the U.S. That's why we're making sure that our operations, again, at our airports, land ports, and elsewhere are but, flexible. But you can't tell us how many your models are anticipating. Uh, no, Senator. Again, I would I would defer you to the uh, Health and Human Services for that. Okay. CDC. Don't you think you ought to check on that? We will. As the head of Homeland Security? Absolutely. And again, we have task force members that are working this on every I'm, day. I'm, I'm all so, for committees and task force. So we're coordinating with them to make but, but sure that our operation... As a secretary, I think you ought to know that answer. I understand that. How is the coronavirus, tra coronavirus transmitted? Uh, through a, a variety of ways. Um, obviously, human to human, we, we've seen that. Uh, and again, we're making sure that those procedures, as they come into the U.S., are medically screened so that we can identify those. How folks. is it transmitted? A variety of different ways, Senator. Tell me what they are, folks. Again, human to human uh, is what we've well, obviously primarily human seen. Human to human, how? Uh, being in the same vicinity, uh, physical contact is usually uh, what we've seen from the medical cases that we've seen here in the U.S. Uh, we've had uh, several, I think two to three human-to-human uh, -human cases that have showed up here in the U.S. So it's those that are closest to those individuals uh, that have that human contact. What's the mortality rate so far nationwide I, I believe it's worldwide? Worldwide, I believe it's under 2%. How, how much under 2%? I, I'll get you an exact figure. I'll, I'll check with CDC on their monitoring uh, the worldwide mortality rate, and I, will, I can get that for you. But you don't know the mortality rate today. It, it changes daily, Senator. Well, I understand that. Given What's about the it, average since we discovered the virus? Again, I, it's under 2%. It was as high as it, 3. Numbers were recalculated based on reporting from China. Is it between 1.5 and, and 2? It's between 1.5 and, and 2%. Okay. What's the mortality rate for influenza over the last, say, 10 years in America? Uh, it's also... Uh, right around that percentage as well. I don't have that offhand, but it's uh, sure right around that? 2% as well. You sure of that? It's a little bit. Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have enough respirators? To my knowledge, we do. I'm focused on making sure that our operators at, at DHS make sure that they have the protective equipment. I know HHS, uh, as part of the supplemental, well, I... We I, just heard testimony that we don't. Testimony from... In a briefing. Okay. Do we have enough respirators or not? For patients? I, I don't understand the question. For everybody, every American who needs one who gets the disease. Uh, again, I would refer you to HHS on that. Mr. Secretary, my you're, budget you're, supports, you're supposed to keep us safe. My budget supports the men and women you're of the, the Department Secretary of Homeland Security. You're the Secretary of Homeland Security. Yes, sir. And you can't tell me if we have enough respirators. Well, we do we have it. enough face masks? We, uh, for the Department of Homeland Security, we I'm do. I'm not asking for the Department of Homeland Security. Are you looking? I'm asking for the American people. For the, for the entire American public? Yes. No, I would say probably not. Okay, how short are we? I, I don't have that number offhand, Senator. I will get that for you. You're asking me a number of medical questions that I'm asking CDC you questions and HHS because you're Secretary of are the Department on. of Homeland Security, and you're supposed to keep us safe. Yes, sir. And you need to know the answers to these questions. And how far away are we from getting a vaccine? In uh, several months. Well, that's not what we just heard testimony about. Okay. 
Who's on first here? HHS is What's the federal second? agency for the coronavirus response. I would refer you to the CDC Mr. on specific questions. Mr. Secretary, questions. I'm going to hush here. You're, you're, you're supposed to keep us safe, and the American people Senator deserve some straight answers on the coronavirus. And Senator, I'm not I, getting them from you. I, I disagree. That's all I have, Madam Chair. That we have a death so quickly identified means this is just the tip of the iceberg. It means that epidemic was probably already spreading in the community for three to four weeks, potentially, even before this death. Because WHO says mild cases have usually two weeks duration and severe cases have three to six weeks. So we're talking at least the epidemic's been around for three weeks before he died. Uh, officials in Washington state, uh, they've just said that this, the coronavirus cases could have been identified in their state earlier, if not for delays in local yes. testing. What does that say to you? Yeah, the, the kits a problem that the CDC had, that they had sent out and recalled, caused enormous delays, up to two weeks delay. And two weeks in this epidemic is literally an eon in amount of transmission. It is an epidemic curve as you see in Korea, of, thou of potentially thousands of cases. So we've lost a good two weeks. And this is why testing as soon as we can to ramp it up is absolutely critical. Here at home, growing concern the virus could quickly impact vulnerable homeless populations in cities across the country. have 15 people and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero. We're going down, not up. We're going very substantially down, not up. I really think, doctor, you want to treat this like you treat the flu, right? And, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be. Fun. Looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. I hope that's true. It's going to disappear one day. It's like a miracle. It will disappear.
Yesterday, the Senate passed my resolution to honor the life of Li Wen Li Yong, the Chinese doctor who heroically tried to warn his fellow citizens and the world about the Wuhan coronavirus late last year. Dr. Li tragically fell victim to that very disease, but not before he was victimized by his own government, the Chinese Communist Party. collective action and cooperation by the people of China to this response. And the interesting thing is that people have commented on that and say, oh, that's easy in a society or a, a political system like, like China. Um, it isn't. It's never easy to get the kind of passion, commitment, interest, and an individual sense of duty that it's our duty to help stop this virus. I mean, we spoke to hundreds of people in hotels, on trains and planes um, who are quite outside the system, and they all shared this sense of responsibility, accountability to be part of this. And the most stunning demonstration of it was when we um, pulled into the train station at night in, um, and it was a special train, because right now, I, I mean, it, it's the saddest thing. In Wuhan, the trains roar right through the station. I mean, continually now for a month, the big inner city trains, they roar right through with the blinds uh, down. And if you're living in the building surrounding them, watching them, um, and people accept that there, but, but you know, we're, we're the only train that stopped so that, you know, six of us could get off that train and be, be part of this. And as I got off, by the way, another group got off and I said, well, hang on a minute. I thought we were the only people allowed to get off in Wuhan. And this was a group that had these little jackets on and a flag. It was a medical team coming in from Guangdong to be part of the 40,000 healthcare workers from other parts of China that have come in many of whom volunteered to go into Wuhan and help with the response. But the, the level of uh, uh, collective action, and, and the striking part when you pull in, is you pull into the city of skyscrapers and massive boulevards, and this, this is not a village, this is a city of 15 million people, a modern city. And as you, as you drive into the city, you know, in the dead of night with the lights on, it's a ghost town. But behind every window and every skyscraper, there are people cooperating with this response. And, you know, people have said, yeah, but, you know, there's a big presence forcing them. There isn't. It's invisible. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's staggering. And every person you talk to there has a sense that they're mobilized, like, like in a war against this virus. And they're organized. <laughs> 